Hello everyone, I'm Jamie Beecham and I'm an education consultant with iLeader. Today I'm going to be talking about choice boards or menu boards. They have lots of different names, but essentially they are a way to design choices for students to pick how they learn, how to practice what they've learned, or how to show what they've learned. I have two kids of my own and I have seen a lot of choice boards coming home. They've had them for every subject music, art, PE, technology, math, ELA, science, social studies. They've had a ton of them, so I've got to do a ton of research on what really make, makes these effective. Plus, I've gone out and sought my own choice boards to see what can we do to make this an effective tool. After all this research, I've discovered five pitfalls in the design of choice boards that make them less effective. So today we're gonna to discuss what are those pitfalls and how can you avoid them and make them more effective for your students. I've invited my colleague, Allison, to come join the discussion about those pitfalls and what we can do. We've had a lot of conversations about choice boards recently. <laughs> uh, it's a great, I love choice boards, but they could uh, really help a child in their learning or hinder a child. They could actually be the barrier sometimes. Agreed. And so I created a choice board on figurative language. And the reason I created it is I wanted to make sure it had all five pitfalls in one board because some of them only have one or two, but I wanted us to see all of them in one space. Okay. All right. So, let's see. It. All right. I think if you look at the tasks individually, they're not bad tasks. Right. Yeah. Taken individually, I think they're, they're great. They could uh, really show a child of, if a child has learned the content or they could help a child learn the content. But I agree all together, uh, there are some issues. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about our first issue. Our first issue is really mixing the purpose of why you created the choice board. So if we okay. look at number three, watch this video to learn about figurative language. The purpose there is to prepare kids. They haven't learned anything about figurative language yet. This is their first initial introduction into figurative language. So that might be a different purpose than some of the other ones. Yeah, so you would assume that this choice board then would be about learning. Yes. Okay. One of the ways to avoid this is to have a clear purpose. Know why are you creating this choice board? Is it to prepare them for something they're going to learn? Is it to practice what they've learned? Or is it to synthesize with a project? Mm -hmm. And all three are great. They are. They are great um, purposes. It's just, as a teacher, you have to decide where the students are in their learning. Exactly. All right, our next pitfall is too many choices or no choices. Yes. I have seen um, a kindergarten choice board with 25 choices. That is a lot of choices for a five or six year old to make. I mean, 25 can be a lot for a middle school or high school, but definitely too many choices for a, a lower grade K2 student. The thing is no choices. So I've seen where it's like, for instance, like this one, you must do squares in red and pick one other square. So it's like, you're actually not giving them a ton of choices. You're just taking, you have to, I want you to do these three things and then you can pick one more. There's actually not a lot of choices on this board. So thinking about choices in a project, Allison and I developed this money project choice board and there's actually only three choices. You don't need a lot of choices. Um, it could be if you have three really good projects and then that's, that's all we put on here. They were really good projects. We felt like we'll just give them three choices and they can choose one of the three. So it still gives the students the opportunity to have that choice in their learning and how they're gonna show their learning. And we're gonna talk about the third pitfall, which is that there is no product or they don't know how to turn things in. So again, if we look at number three, watch this video. How do we know they did it? Uh, you don't think about it as a teacher. You might just be thinking, oh, I just want them to watch the video, but how do you know that the child has actually done that? Writing, even just writing 10 different similes and finish the comparison below, she moved as slow as, 
I have seen my own child try and fit all 10 of those in a box, in that box, yes. in the choice board. So I have to fit everything I can into the box. Right. And that a lot of it, it being, even with middle schoolers, I feel like I've seen that where they, it's not explicit directions where it tells students exactly where to write them, how to turn it in. I think we need to be more clear with students so they know exactly what our expectation is. Right. The fourth pitfall is time. Yes, I've seen this a lot. Um, as teachers, as we are creating choice boards, is not thinking about the time that it takes to do different tasks on the choice board. If you're looking at this figurative language example, mm -hmm. uh, there definitely are some different, like I'm looking at number four, write 10 different similes, that could be pretty short. Um, you're just writing 10 different similes. Then you look at creating an iMovie in number five. You know, that's, that time is gonna take a lot longer. Uh, they're very different expectations on the time it takes on some of these tasks. A way you can avoid this pitfall is label, when you're designing it, label the time you think it's gonna take to do each one of these. Mm -hmm. and, and really thinking through that, because. I think as teachers, sometimes we have these great ideas for tasks. And then when we actually think, well, how long would it actually take a student to do that? It kind of takes it another level uh, as you're creating these choice boards. Our last pitfall we're gonna discuss is the varying levels of cognitive demand. Yes. So when we ask kids to do a choice board, sometimes we ask a real low level task and sometimes we ask a real high level task. Mm -hmm. If you look, writing a poem using four examples of figurative language in number eight is a very different cognitive demand than number two, where they were just completing a figurative language worksheet, where they're just identifying things. Right, so the solution to this would be to label the cognitive demands for each task on your choice board. So now knowing the pitfalls, Allison and I created a figurative language practice choice board that shows how you can be very deliberate in how you design it. As you can see, we have a clear purpose. We even labeled it at the top. This is your figurative language practice choice board. Because remember, there's three different purposes. You could prepare, practice, or project. So we chose that practice. The next thing we looked at is the appropriate number of choices. Because this was a practice, we felt like three choices is too few. Mm -hmm. um, 15, 16 choices may be too many ways to practice it. So we felt if they were able to practice it at least three different ways, then we would get what we needed from this choice board. Mm -hmm. The next thing you'll notice is there are some bolded things that tell us what would, where they should be doing things on Flipgrid or if there's a worksheet. We also italicized the verbs so that way they would know what they needed to do. So the product is very clear in each of these. The next thing was time. So we went through and labeled how much time we thought each one of these things would take. Mm -hmm. Which was interesting because sometimes you think of a some awesome tasks to put on the choice board and then you realize that one's going to take an hour and this one's going to take five minutes so that was uh, interesting to do is to actually label those times and our last pitfall was varying levels of cognitive demand so you can see we labeled like a low a medium and a high level of demand and we asked the kids to do one of each mm -hmm. So they're still getting, they have to do a lower level, they have to do a middle level, and they have to do a high level. We think choice boards are an excellent way of having student autonomy, of assessing, of pre-teaching, and of practicing. So we think this is, it could be one of the many answers to what's school gonna look like next year because it can translate home it can also be in the classroom, something you can use if you're working with a small group of kids. So we're excited to see your choice boards and how you avoid all five pitfalls of choice boards in your classroom. Yes, looking forward to seeing everybody's choice boards. Put it in the comments. 
And remember, you can subscribe to iLeader to get all these Friday freebies. All right, thanks everybody. Bye.